a truly inspiring place. A place where people set out to deal with nature in a new way. The richness of the art, the mosaics, the gemstones make it very, very special. It is truly inspirational. It's an enigma. We, we know a lot, but there's so much more we don't know, and there's always a challenge of finding out. Welcome to Fishbourne Roman Palace, one of Britain's most important Roman sites. The remains of this impressive building, with its fine mosaic floors, are a reminder of the wealth and extravagance of the Roman Empire. They also give us an insight into the lives of the people who lived here. Our understanding of the palace comes from the excavations of the site in recent years by Sussex Archaeological Society staff, and especially through the pioneering work in the 1960s of the eminent archaeologist Professor Barry Cunliffe. The site was first found in 1960 when a workman was using a JCB to dig a big trench right across the field to lay a water main. It was very much in the pioneering stages of archaeology. There was no money, uh, there were no archaeological units, and it was an entirely amateur affair. The amateurs, local amateurs, found it, and we as local amateurs um, did the initial excavation. Some of the summers we had up to 100 volunteers a day, which was quite a lot, once we actually peaked at 120. The most amazing time was um, right at the end of the first season's excavation, when we were just finishing, it literally was the last day, uh, and I, I wanted to find out what was in, as it were, the next room of the, the uh, north wing, which we had got a bit of. Uh, and I got people to put down a little narrow trial trench, it was two feet wide, uh, which would have gone through the centre of the room. And what they found just below the plough soil um, was the dolphin mosaic. In fact, the trench went exactly through the middle of the dolphin mosaic. And we just stood there on the grass looking down at this mosaic, the whole trench filled with mosaic, thinking this can't be true, this is absolutely amazing. It was very important for us to give the site a high, high profile because um, its future was unassured at that stage. In fact, it was quite possible it was going to be sold for development, housing development. Um, but what we managed to do right at the beginning was to get Ivan Margery interested. Ivan Margery was a local archaeologist or local amateur archaeologist who was very wealthy. Um, and as soon as he saw the quality of what was there, uh, he decided to buy the site and to uh, put up the money for the cover building, which is uh, now, now there and which we all enjoy. The excavations that have taken place to date allow us a glimpse back in time to what life would have been like in the palace's heyday. This was a huge and impressive building, especially by the standards of the time, with more than 100 rooms. It was much more than a family home, it was an administrative and political centre and a bold statement of wealth and authority. Whoever lived in Fishbourne Palace had power and influence. David Rudkin, director of the palace for almost 30 years, will show you around. This part of Britain would have appeared very different when the palace was built around about AD 75, about 30 years after the Roman invasion and almost 2,000 years ago. There would have been more farmland, but far fewer houses. And those would have been round, with thatched roofs, set in small groups among the fields. The people would mostly be farmers, raising livestock and tilling the fields. There were roads. One of them led to the palace from the nearby town of Novio Margus Reginorum, or Chichester as we know it today. I'm now standing where that road would have run. Just imagine what it might have felt like to be one of those farmers walking along this road on your first visit to the palace. As you approached, the entrance hall would have towered above you. Inside the magnificent entrance hall, you'll walk between the enormous columns supporting the roof and around the ornamental pool. 
you walk through into these impressive formal gardens. You've never seen anything like it with the neatly clipped box hedges, the beautiful statues and the bubbling fountains. The Romans were skilled gardeners. They appeared to have mastery over nature itself. As you walk through the gardens, the four surrounding wings all appear to be looking inwards, into the garden and at you. This is typical Mediterranean design, as is the architecture of the rest of the palace, transported as it was to Britain at the very edge of the empire. Finally, approach the audience chamber at the centre of the west wing, where the owner awaits you. By this time, you're totally intimidated and your knees are trembling. So here we are at last in the audience chamber. This was the focal point of the whole site, and it was from here that the owner, probably a local king, looked after Rome's interests. He would have been visited by all sorts of people from all sorts of places, and you are one of them. We know most about the north wing of the palace, because it hasn't been as badly damaged by ploughing as the other three wings. Here are two or three luxurious suites of rooms, perhaps for an extended family or for very important visitors. This large room, approached up a flight of steps from its own courtyard, was almost certainly a dining room. But other rooms would have been used for a whole range of activities, perhaps as a bedroom at night and an office by day, because for the Romans, the home was also the workplace. The extended family at the palace would probably have included grandparents, brothers, sisters and cousins, children and slaves. As many as a hundred people could have lived here, making it a lively, bustling place. The palace was also a place of great wealth and privilege. Walls were plastered and painted or set with marble inlays. Floors were covered with fine mosaics, usually with intricate geometric patterns in black on a white background. And the people who lived in the palace were incredibly fortunate compared to those outside its walls. Waited on by a host of slaves, they enjoyed the luxuries of underfloor heating and baths, while drinking imported wines and eating the best food from fine tableware. But who was the mystery man at the centre of all this? Who was it that lived here? Well, a man who believes he knows is Dr. Martin Hennig, an archaeologist who studied the subject. The man who lived here was very probably Tiberius Claudius Togidabnus, who seems to have been given citizenship by the Emperor Claudius when he was a very young man. And uh, when he came, to, came over to Britain, replaced the then ruler, a man called Verica, and uh, became one of the most powerful people in southern Britain uh, throughout much of the first century AD. The bust in the museum is that of uh, a young man, a youth, and it's very probably the young Togidabnus himself. It would have been carved around 40 AD, and he would have brought it with him to Britain, and it would have been one of his most prized possessions throughout his very long reign. He was called Great King in Britain on an inscription set up in nearby Chichester. He very probably later in his reign not only uh, greatly enlarged this palace, but also was responsible for other great projects, including the building of the Temple of Sulis Minerva at Bath. I see Togidabnus as being a very genial man, somebody I very much warm to, who was taking part in a great adventure, liberating his country from its enemies and who must have reveled in the fact that he had given his people a much better life. There was no conquest here. This was a case of Britons seeing themselves as Romans, acting as Romans and living like Romans. Do we know how it all ended? Yes. There was a disastrous fire sometime between AD 270 and 280, when the north and probably the west wings burnt to the ground. Whether it was an accident or the work of raiding pirates, we'll never really know. But certainly the palace didn't recover from the fire. The remaining wings were demolished and the stone reused. 
some of it possibly in the building of the defensive walls around Chichester. A century or two later, the site was used for burial of the dead. Four graves were found during the excavations, dug into the palace remains. Later still, the land was being ploughed, and plough marks can still be seen cutting into one of the mosaic floors. Finally, the land was given over to pasture, and sheep peacefully grazed above the sleeping remains of the palace until that momentous day in 1960, when the water company dug their trench. When you walk around the North Wing remains, picture yourself as King Toggy Dubnus surveying his palace and admiring his mosaic floors. But also enjoy the later mosaics, such as the Cupid on a dolphin, which he didn't live to see. Think of the luxuries that the Romans enjoyed. Underfloor heating, bath suites, elegant rooms and private courtyards. In the museum, Imagine how the archaeologists felt as they uncovered each artefact and used it to piece together the Fishbourne story. Wander through the remarkable formal garden, replanted to its original plan as discovered during the 1960s excavations. In the plant display area, see the types of plants that may have grown in the original palace gardens many of which were imported from elsewhere in the Roman Empire. In the Roman garden, listen to our rather depressed Roman gardener telling you more about the gardens. Finally, don't miss the Collections Discovery Centre opposite the main entrance. Here you'll see our conservation laboratory and artefact stores. Ask our staff about hands-on guided tours of these collections. If there's anything else that you'd like to know, then please ask. Everyone will be happy to help. Enjoy your visit.